Hi everyone, welcome to ODI Fridays. Um, I'm Hannah Folds, I'm Head of Marketing and Membership here at the ODI. Uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Jamie Campbell here uh, to talk um, from Bud. Bud is a network of financial services and fintechs that help customers to uh, find new products and services. Um, and today he's going to be talking about how to capitalise on open banking. Now, just before we start, um, if you don't mind leaving any questions to the very end, and I'll pass the mic over to you. The mic's not going to make your voice any louder. It's just for the people watching the live stream at home uh, to hear you. If you are watching from the live stream at home, please use hashtag ODI Fridays, and then I will read them out at the end. And um, yeah, over to you. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and everyone at home, I guess. Uh, thanks for coming along. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, open banking. And, uh, and kind of Bud's uh, role that we're, hope, you know, that we're, that we're playing in, in, in that space. But um, before we get started, I am conscious that open banking is uh, a term that a lot of people um, bound around a lot and, uh, and, and, and often it can be very useful to just before we get into the weeds of, of, of all of this, just to do a bit of a recap. You know what the hell is it, and uh, and and what are the terms and the and the, and the the abbreviations that I'm going to be using throughout this presentation? What do they what do they all mean? So open banking is a mandate from the CMA, uh, which is a competition markets authority here in uh, here in the UK. Um, it's imposed on the top nine banks in the UK, uh, and it's how um, you know the UK will will answer the European regulation of of PSD two. Sorry, I think we're going to do questions at the. I think we're going to do questions right at the end, um, but it's a it's a good one, and I should probably have a list um, memorized. Uh, it covers account aggregation, so bringing together the information from current accounts uh, into one into one place, and it covers payments as well. So the ability to initiate payments on a consumer's request, um, you know, from your bank to 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 another. And generally speaking. Uh, banks have been pretty uh, negative about about open banking, uh, probably up until around six six months ago. Um, but it is seen as a, as a as a great move for for consumers. And then the glossary, so CMA Competition Markets Authority, as I've said, PSD two is the Payment Services Directive two, um, AISP is Account Information Service Provider. Uh, PISP is the Payment Initiation Service Provider. ASPSP. You know, I mean, they get very quite ridiculous. Uh, basically, an ASPSP is a bank, so I don't know why they just don't say bank. Uh, TPP, which is a third-party provider, which is a company like us who take advantage of the uh, the new licenses. API application program interfaces; those are the, the 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 kind of the bits of code which securely connect two systems together, and kind of what this is all um, based on. Uh, and platform, so. Bird is a platform, and, and really that is a, a technology provider who has um, who has kind of vendors on one side, uh, customers on another, and the platform is flexible enough that other technologies can be built on top of that. So, those are kind of the terms that I'm going to be using throughout the uh, throughout the presentation. If at all uh, I stop making sense, then you know, hopefully, well, just put your hand up. So. The current situation with banks. I should say, um, I try and make all the presentations I do look very look look very nice, and there's no real good picture of uh, of, a, of a bank. So this is singer songwriter uh, Banks. Uh, she's she's uh, from uh, California, and her latest single is out now on Spotify. Um, but the UK banking sector, you know, there's, there's there's a few major players which roughly bank around 80% of the population. Uh, they own all the access to the to the data. Um, they Historically, have not been providing, uh, you know, a great experience for for, for customers. Uh, there is a need for for more competition, um, and they're relatively slow to innovate due to the systems that they're uh, that they're built on. Um, so this is kind of why open banking has been, you know, has 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 come into play in PSD two is to introduce more competition and better service and better outcomes for uh, for customers in in the banking space. And when we talk about new competition um, for banks, a lot of talk is around challenger banks, and uh, and really they've kind of they've shown how uh, banking can be done. Whether it's um, you know the online processes of opening a, opening accounts, 
uh, you know, real quick payments, better insights in, on your on your spending, uh, or just generally a better experience when you're when when you're when you're using products. Um, but this was something that we kind of looked at, at as we started the uh, as we started Bud, which is if you want to take advantage of all of these new services, then you'll have to have a kind of a screen like this. You know, multiple different apps, multiple different services, all providing uh, you know different features, which traditionally you would go to one bank for. Um, and what's, what's, what's interesting about that is if you break up and silo all of these services, then there's no data which can connect them all together and, and, and offer you real insight on your, on your spending uh, and your behavior as, a, as, as an individual. So that's kind of what Bud started. Um, you know, that was our ambition when we, when we started the company was we wanted to provide a, a single point of access to all of the financial services market. You know, this network of, of financial services is, is kind of what we wanted to, um, what we wanted to provide. But new competition is something that banks have, have, have had to deal with over the, last, over the last few years. But what's interesting about open banking is it opens up competition to some other players. If you are mandated to allow your customers to have their data analyzed anywhere they, anywhere they choose, or if your customers can initiate a payment from anywhere that they choose outside of the bank's digital channels, then really those capabilities, those just two capabilities are what underpins daily banking, really. If I go in and see how much money I've got and if I want to make a payment to someone, those are the kind of two factions which, which kind of underpin uh, daily banking. And now with these two licenses, there's nothing stopping another company, whether it's any of these or whether it's a retailer, whether it's a telco, um, you know, from looking at the market and saying, well, if we have these two licenses, um, then we can offer a banking experience to our customers because they can keep their uh, current account, they can keep their money in their current account with their traditional bank. Um, and they can use an experience that we offer to them in, a, in, in, the digital, in the digital sense. So banks, because of open banking, are facing a, a new type of competition that they're probably, they haven't really been used to fighting. You know, normally for banks, the, the competition has been all about you know, who, who owns the current account of the, of the customer. But a new battleground is going to uh, emerge, which is who owns the attention of the customer uh, when, it, when it comes to dealing with financial services. Because... You know, under all of these things, this is the kind of, I guess, the equation that, um, you know, that, that keeps most bankers afraid of, of op open banking. And this is an incredibly simplified version of what I assume is an incredibly complex, um, you know, documents within, within banks. But really it looks at the general cost structures of a, of, of a bank and where they make money. Uh, in, in, in simple terms. So uh, I guess the key thing to pull out on the cost structure is that distribution costs amount to about 40%, 45% of total costs coming onto a bank. Uh, and then in the profitability um, side, you have, uh, you know, I guess what all of this means is you have a very, you know, good ROE making business, which is your sales, and you have a relatively poor ROE making business, which is, you know, the business of making money from having lots of money. The problem with that uh, part of the business is that it is incredibly highly regulated and not a very nice place to play in. And so really, when you think about open banking and, uh, and, and this new uh, way in which banks are going to have to compete with other providers, the attention uh, level of, of, of customers, really that directly affects the far right column. You know, if you lose the attention of your customers, then you lose opportunities to create a 20% ROE business. Uh, if you can't interact with the customer and make them aware of those products and services that you're offering or engage them in, in, uh, in helpful journeys to get them to, to, you know, to adopt a product, then, you, you know, then you're effectively limiting yourself to, uh, to the business of, of balance sheet provision. And, uh, and, and no bank, I don't think, wants to be left with a 5% uh, ROE uh, business. Equally, when you look at fintechs who are kind of built on the, from the ground up using cl cloud providers, you know, relatively cheap to operate, who are passing those uh, cost savings onto their customers, that distribution cost of 45%, you know, it, it starts to become a, a real big, a big hindrance. So these are the kinds of things that open banking, I, I think, are starting to shed more light on in terms of, well, how, how does a bank, how does a large bank um, kind of adapt to this, to this market in a way that maintains, a, you know, a good, a good level of business? Because meanwhile, like I said, the fintech sector is growing uh, over 1,600 new companies providing an, uh, a better service, uh, you know, costing much less to run, uh, and, they're, and they're offering better rates to their, to their customers. 
So new regulation that's increasing um, competition uh, and, and this new battleground of, of, of attention that I've been speaking of uh, in a market where uh, product level innovation is, is at its highest it's probably ever been. Um, and a regulation which arguably is paving a way for, for, for big tech firms to kind of move in and, and offer um, you know, new services to customers. Uh, you know, banks really do risk losing the attention of their, of their customers. So it sounds pretty uh, drab, uh, but that's the, that's the fear bit. And now it's onto the, 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 the fun bit. So then, you know, enter Bud. What are we doing, um, you know, to help big banks? Because that's essentially at the heart of our business model is, you know, we have gone out to partner with multiple financial services. In the intro, you know, it's described as a financial services network. Um, and really, that's what it is. We partner with multiple financial services. Um, we integrate their services into our platform using APIs. So providing the customer with the ability to have an end-to-end -end experience with multiple different services in one place. And then we license that capability to banks. So I'll kind of very briefly run you through how that works. Um, so it starts with aggregation. So this is the um, AIS license from uh, Open Banking, aggregating accounts all in one place. And then through our kind of data capability at Bud, we, you know, we use that aggregated transactional data to an, analyze and identify journeys that customers are on from their spending patterns and spending behaviors. Once we understand the, uh, you know, the, the, the individual from the data that they've, been, um, you know, uh, that they've shown, we can trigger our marketplace of financial providers. We've got around 70 um, partners uh, currently on the retail space. And also we have a payments capability as well. So the actual ability for customers to go and, to, to go and do things. So aggregation, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you can bring all of your accounts into, into, into one screen uh, and you can get total balances. You can kind of deep dive further into um, insights, you know, how you're spending. Uh, we can break it down by spending, da spending down by uh, category, uh, by location. Uh, you know, all these kind of um, personal financial management tools that you see from a lot of the challenges and a lot of the, uh, the newer players who are taking existing data that, uh, that a customer has and repurposing it just so it's a little bit more helpful for, 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 for individuals. And then this idea of journey recognition. So I, I mentioned it earlier. Um, let's just take this example of booking a holiday. Uh, you make a transaction with Virgin Holidays um, and you know, that is a pretty key indicator that uh, you're probably gonna do something with, with holidays. Um, from, from that, we can kind of you know, start powering new experiences like offering them uh, Forex uh, you know, for, for when they're going on, on holiday or equally scanning their transactions, noticing whether or not they're paying for any insurance provider and then powering that marketplace of financial products to introduce them to uh, you know, something like an insurance provider just so that they can keep themselves protected whilst they're away. So really taking the, the first step, that first piece of effort of a customer, you know, um, coming into contact with helpful products and services for them, um, and and really making that that step as, as as short and as easy and painless as possible. And then the marketplace. So I mentioned that we had over seventy customers, uh, seventy partners, um, and this is kind of what a passive our passive marketplace looks like. So you can kind of come in here and uh, and shop around all of the different products and services that are available. Uh, anything from pensions, investments, credit digital mortgage brokers, insurance, even utility bill switching. Uh, all of these products are all integrated into the service so uh, customers can, can, can engage with these products and, and not have to download new apps or visit new websites. They can kind of do it all, all in one place. And then the kind of the user journeys, as I, as I mentioned, doing it all in one place. So being within the experience, uh, logging into, creating a user and, and logging into your, let's just say your TransferWise account, um, you know, sending money and actually actioning all of that stuff from within, you know, one place. So not having to go to a different app uh, and to do all this, to do all this functionality. So really, kind of, we're working with banks to uh, to, to speed up collaborations with with, with fintechs. We know that um, you know to for, for banks to keep being competitive, uh, they need to lower costs. Often that means uh, creating new systems or partnering with new systems. Uh, going through a procurement process of a bank, I'm not sure if anyone here has done it, roughly takes uh, between nine and, uh, nine and 12 months. Uh, not really scalable if you're looking to use multiple different providers to solve multiple different problems. Um, with Bird, all you have to do is partner with one company uh, and we kind of take care of all the implementation of, of all the other APIs uh, for, in terms of the procurement. Um, 
And then, you know, leveraging third parties to offer new services to your customers. If you're a bank and you don't have a wealth proposition, uh, and instead of kind of spending uh, two years and, and a lot more money kind of developing a wealth proposition, you can approach us and we can tailor a wealth market uh, marketplace for your customers and then through one interaction point you know link you to multiple different wealth offerings um, and then using our PIS license uh, the payment initiation service license helping customers move money around that ecosystem uh, for, for, for less money every time you're kind of processing a payment you know there's a cost attributed to that um, and via the, uh, the the new PIS license that cost is is, is mitigated um, and as I said, we're working with uh, we're working with banks, and currently, you know, Bud is being used to power some of the most interesting uh, apps on the on the market. Um, the most recent one is our collaboration with HSBC and First Direct, um, which is called Arthur, which is going to be out next week. Uh, we're very excited, um, Arthur A R T H A, which is Sanskrit for the means of life. Um, so, so there you go. Uh, and really, some of the kind of key features of, of, of Arthur is, uh, you know, providing a, a notifications dashboard. So taking, you know, consumer, the, the, the transactional data um, and kind of providing that first step for people. So, you know, having one place to tap when someone's gone over, gone over a spending target or noticing when someone's paying over the odds for utility bills and having a one place where they can tap and be taken through a, a utility bill uh, switching experience. So that's very exciting um, and we'll be doing more of the same uh, over, the, over the coming years. So uh, I think hopefully I come under time. I'm, like I said, I'm Jamie Campbell. Um, that's my email address if any of you uh, have any kind of questions you don't want to ask here. But uh, thank you very much for your time, everyone. Uh, has anyone got any questions? And there is a microphone. Can you pass around this microphone? No, I'm going to kick off with a question. Okay. Um, can you tell me a bit about the background of Bud? Uh, who started it and why? Yeah, so the co-founders are um, Ed Maslovakis and George Dunning. Um, they have known each other since they were like 10 years old. Um, Ed, uh, he was working at Salesforce. Uh, he was working between the UK and Ireland. And uh, he wanted a way of using uh, a currency exchange provider. I think it was TransferWise. He wanted a way of using that in his banking app, which so he could kind of say so he started having this idea of why can't I use a provider that I prefer with an experience that I prefer, but in my trusted bank? Um, I think that was kind of the, the you know, the, the, the spark of, of, of what we, you know, what we try to try to create. Um, and yeah, and that was in 2015. Uh, and initially, when we set the company up, we wanted it to be a, a, a one place where, com where anyone can use any financial product with a one point of access. Um, and then kind of over... Uh, over a series of iterations on a, on a product, we wanted to get something something to market. Um, and during that time, we were, we were you know we were looking at the fintech market and and you know looking at adoption rates. And you know we really thought that this was something that big banks could could benefit from. So we started having conversations with with larger banks around their kind of you know their strategies for open banking and, and PSD two and things like that. And um, you know and how they wanted to offer different services to their to their customers. And I think from there it, it kind of it, you know it kicked off it kicked off from there. So yeah, we've been going about two and a half years. Um, you know, delivering against delivering against this kind of ambition that we've had. Thank you. Yeah. Have any questions from the audience? Over there. Um, if you feel comfortable telling me your name and, and which company you come from, sure. that'd be great. Hi, my name is Mekarek Diraba. I'm a co-founder of a company called Sona. We make invoicing solutions for small businesses. I have two questions. The first is, is Bud only for the consumer or is there a business banking component? And the second is, on the marketplace, can you talk a little bit more how startups can sort of integrate with that marketplace? Yep. Okay. So, I mean, great questions. Uh, so, we, we initially set up as a, as a retail, retail customers only. Um, but in the, uh, in the summer of last year, we were um, part of a... Uh, com uh, a, com a competition run by Nesta, which is a, an ex-government uh, innovation agency, um, to replicate the retail proposition as a business banking solution as well. Um, and we finished building a demo uh, of that in, in December, and we're putting more and more effort into, in, into making that available. Um, we've been speaking to a lot of banks you know, who, who look at the business banking market and, 
and, and see it as a, as, as a difficult market to, to play in, in terms of how do you get you know, small businesses which are relatively low in, on revenue making, but give them a, a, an excellent experience. Um, so we've been, we've been working with a few banks to, to, to do that. Uh, on the marketplace, um, we have a kind of a three-stage process of, of integrating uh, companies into, into the marketplace. The first one starts with a due diligence piece. So, um, you know, just, you know, regular things like how's it funded, who's, who's, who's funding it, um, business model, how long has it been going, um, and a, a small technical uh, DD, and then from there, it's there's a relatively low integration where we um, where we put a tracking link on our we set you up with a marketplace page, you provide all the content, uh, it gets a once over from our um, you know from our reg and compliance teams. If it's approved, it goes live with a tracking link, which takes people to your to your website to find out more information. And then the third stage is um, it's entirely dependent on the technical capabilities of the partner. Uh, if there are APIs ready and uh, things that can be integrated into the platform, then we will go about doing that. Um, you know, as, as as soon as it it can be it can be arranged with our with our kind of tech team on our, in one of our tech sprints. So, um, really, the the this process is 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 pretty great, I think, for 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 companies who want distribution within the marketplace and who want to be um, distributed to 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 bank customers. Uh, Ava Pasco from the Retail Practice. Um, question: uh, At the moment, the access is read-only, I presume, for the uh, data that you can read from my bank account. Would that be so? In terms of the API access yeah. from the yeah, so I th in with the uh, account aggregation service, it's it, that's read-only, but the uh, payment initiation is a is a right. They're, they're, those are writing permissions, so you can action. Um, you can action payments with those. Right. So, those how permissions. does the cybersecurity accountability sits within the beyond read only? Yeah. So the um, I guess in terms of the uh, the standards that have been written for for, for payments, um, we're using a bank API. So. Although you're, you're using it on, on our service, for a customer, you'll be using it within your bank service. You're actually using your own bank's systems. So it's, it's their API which is being uh, called to power the payment service. So it's actually safer than uh, if you were to do something like that now because you're not sharing with our company your credentials. You're just you know, using your credentials to, to, to log into your bank, but it's powered through our service. And it's crystal clear that if anything goes wrong, is the bank's problem, not yours. Yes. Yeah. 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 So in, all, in every, in every, in every, uh, in every step, you know, we make people aware of, of of what's happening and how and how the service is, is working. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Howard Grubb from Modular Financial Technologies, your capital markets fintech. Hi. Hi. Uh, just you mentioned the utility bill example and other things like insurance. So where do you get the other information which is not covered by PSD two from? In terms of uh, well, to advise someone on a utility uh, switching utility bills, you need to know their energy usage, cost per unit, all that kind of stuff, which is not part of the payment. Yeah, yeah. So we the connections that we have are with we have third parties who provide the uh, the switching services, and when you engage with those services, that's when we that's when you can get all of that information. So um, you know, if you like myself, I got a, an eight hundred pound charge from from an energy provider. Um, you know, I expect that to to ping my uh, my app, which will provide me with a notification that says, "Have you seen this bill? Why don't you see if you can save money by clicking it?" And it will power an introduction to someone like Flipper, who is a an energy bill, uh, a bit a utility bill um, switching service. So and in there, I will I will have to enter the the the, the details. I have the information. So a quick supplementary question on that: How do you get paid? What's your revenue model? So we uh, charge a licensing fee to the bank, mm -hmm. uh, and we have a flat. Uh, flat fees across all of the uh, partners that we that we work with on a uh, lifetime revenue um, basis. So, you know, for us, it's it's, you know, we don't get paid more by another company. We never get paid to promote a service above another service. Um, you know, we're we're really there to kind of help users who are time strapped or or who aren't, you know, 100%. You know, aware of what they can do with their money, come into contact with ways of, 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 of saving more. Hi, my name is Andrew Hurd. I'm from Computer Share. Hi. Um, how much of this is reliant upon individuals giving permission for access to their data? Well, I guess 
it depends what part of the service that they want to use. I think the marketplace is is completely separate. Um, you can passively shop around the marketplace for for, for new products and services, um, irrespective of if you've uh, given access to, uh, to to data. You know, if you're someone who wants to look at a curated list of of, of new providers um, in a way that's easy to navigate and informative, then you can you can kind of go through the marketplace. Um, you know, without um, without sharing any data. If I could just follow up on that. So on the aggregation service, without access to that data, that link between opportunity and the cues that you might get from the marketplace, is that broken or does that still work in some way? No, it's definitely a better experience if you have, uh, if you have your accounts linked. You know, we, we want to take away friction from uh, people discovering products. So, you know, by, by linking the accounts, uh, you know, you can start to use data to power some of those some of those experiences which which we we think is is a, is a better experience but uh, the product isn't isn't solely reliant on on a customer doing that and and how are first direct approaching that in respect to arta uh just very openly um you know the the app will go live with aggregation services aggregating i think six banks uh, and some credit card providers as well um, and uh, and it will go to i think 7000 customers to begin with for the for the first stage of the pilot um, we have some. We have uh, a number of services in the marketplace. Some of which are competitive services from competitive providers of of, of First Direct um, within that marketplace to really start to show that a big bank can start to de democratize a, a lot of the stuff around 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 finance. Um, you know, by by showing their customers options and, and different things that they can do with their money. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diego Cominazzini from Deloitte Digital. Um, I was wondering if you're planning to get to a point using these APIs to automate some of the personal finance decisions with a small workflow engine of sorts, e.g. if I have this much money in my bank account every 30th of a month, put X amount of that into an ISA or that sort of thing, or whether there are still within PSD2 some technological barriers to that? Yeah, I think we, you know, we are definitely looking at rules-based um, uh, systems such as that. Uh, I think a lot of people in, who work at the company have wanted that themselves. Um, you know, if I have 200 quid in my account that I never that I never touch, it would be good if I could like set a rule that you know put it into my savings account. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of work that we still have to do with the APIs. Um, you know, to get to a position where that's uh, where that's possible and, and, a, and a great experience but absolutely that's that's where we that's where we as a company want to want to want to take want to take this so that it can automate a lot of the the, the kind of decisions that either you forget about or, um, or or you kind of you know just don't don't know about because you know, you're not you're not bothered about your money um, which can happen Jamie just a question on time scale so you, you're, you're launching a, a pilot with with First Direct, as you've already alluded yep. to. Uh, how, how big a market opportunity do you see this as being, and what sort of time scale do you see it as evolving in? Yeah, I, th I think um, it's funny, because open banking has, has, has not had a, a good PR start, um, if anyone laughs around the, uh, laughs around the room. Uh, it's, um, generally speaking, I think the value of, of open banking won't be understood until people can see it, you know? And they can point at an example and go, "Oh, that's that's what open banking is. That's what that looks like." You know. And I think, um, you know, taking whole picture analytics of someone spending, even just you know something that's really simple for me is I spend all my money on my credit card. Uh, and so when I look at my bank account, I'm like, "Quid's in? I'm doing really well." Uh, and then the credit card gets paid off, and I'm you know, and I'm and I'm not in a good position. But just by having uh, you know a simple aggregation service, you can see the net you know, your net position of, of money. And for someone who is not so financially literate like myself, that's actually really, really, really valuable. And when I go and show someone this very easy piece of, of, of technology to do, um, for someone who isn't making spreadsheets every month to, to see how they're, how they're spending their money, you know, that is something that is immediately of value. And I think as, um, you know, as with anything, Arthur is, is the first big bank initiative in, in open banking, which will be available to customers. And I think for, for a bank like HSBC to be at the forefront of that, I think is incredibly brave. And I think they're going to be, you know, I think they will show these examples. They will, they will be the first example in the market of what actually it looks like. And, uh, and I think that will drive, um, you know, demand. I don't think it will be 
me standing on stage telling people about APIs that's going to get anyone interested in, in, as a customer, interested in open banking. What it will be is when you're sat at a pub and your friend shows you uh, this new app that they're using, um, I think that's what's going to be uh, going to drive a lot of the, a lot of the demand. What's cool about um, Arthur and open banking in, in general is you don't have to be a first direct customer to have the app. You could have, a, you could have your money in your Barclays account and just use the aggregation service to bring it into the, to the Arthur app. So I think that's another interesting area that, um, you know, that, that banks can start to use these um, new uh, financial experiences to bring in non-customers into, their, into their world of, of, of what kind of finances could be. Um, and then provide a you know and then provide a switching service from from within there. I don't I don't I don't think that's what I was saying earlier about having the the battle for the current account is is going to be second to the battle for, for for the attention because you know if you're a Barclays customer and you can download a First Direct app and use it perfectly fine as you would a Barclays app but it's better and you enjoy it more then you know I think that those are, those are, those are the interesting um, kind of experiences that, I, that that Arthur will will start to um, kind of show in terms of the capabilities for open banking. Can I ask you another question? Of course, we should have a chat afterwards. Sorry, I think. Yeah, <laughs> sure. um, everything you've talked about so far is, is kind of B2C yep. in, its, in its definition. Um, we're, we're in uh, mortgage servicing and mortgage origination. How do, how, how do you see this evolving into B2B as well? So think about income and expenditure, affordability, yeah. access to this kind of data could be really powerful in that space. Is that an evolution that you see coming at some point? Yeah, I think, um, I think we are we're one of three companies who carry dual licenses, who carry the uh, account aggregation and the payments licenses under open banking. Those capabilities are very powerful. Um, and when you take it to any industry who has an interest in, in, in understanding their customers more to provide a better experience, more tailored products, faster, um, you know, <coughs> faster processes going, going through, you know, credit making decisions or, or, or pre-authorization, all of those things um, you know, can benefit from having uh, you know, this type of data informing those, informing those decisions. So I absolutely see a situation where, um, you know, where, where people are making, where, where people aren't going and getting these licenses themselves because you know, it's not easy to go and, and, and get a, a license and most companies would not want to go out and actively get more regulation. But I definitely see a situation where people who ha carry these licenses, making them available to, you know, to, to multiple businesses um, you know, to help improve the experiences that they're offering to their customers, whether it's uh, you know, faster checkout, whether it's um, better lines of credit or, um, or, or otherwise. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I have another one too. <laughs> um, in terms of time scales, again, say I am a business who's interested in having a connector and appear on your marketplace. And let's assume that we're starting from a point where my APIs are ready yep. and my customer journeys are designed. What time scales are we looking at and what sort of support do you offer me then? Should I change my API definition in the future, which I probably will? Yeah, I, it, 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 I know. It's such a cop out to say it depends, obviously. Um, but on the on the complexities of the APIs, are they read only APIs? Um, are they writing? You know, do you have write permissions? You know, uh, can we create a user using those APIs? Um, you know, does there need to be an element of KYC on the on the on the journey? Um, but most of the time, um, as a, as a kind of a, a blanket answer, we will <laughs> sit with. We'll have, we have in-house design. They'll sit with your kind of customer journeys. Um, you know, they'll, they'll replicate the journeys from a, from a design point of view for you to be approved. Um, and then we'll go about implementing the, uh, the APIs on our, on our tech sprints. And they will be, they'll, they'll all be batched in a, in, a, in a way that kind of sits with the other priority stuff that we've, that we've got on. So um, in terms of giving you a timeline, exact timeline, I can't without knowing the exact, exact stuff. But that is the process. Um, you know, we, we've done it a few times with, it, you know, with a number of companies and it's and it, it seems to work relatively well um, it's very collaborative it's you know it's, it's what you'd expect a, a, a small nimble company like ourselves to, to, to offer uh, to get someone's product you know integrated the insurance products and that kind of thing at what point does any of this become advice in a regulatory um, sort of viewpoint yeah it's a great question um, you know we we do a lot to make sure that we are um, making people more aware of, of products that are, that are in the market. Um, but we're also very aware that we're not directing someone to a single solution. 
um, you know, our, our product and the, any kind of connections that we have to uh, introduce people to services are introducing someone to a range of things for them to go and you know, read up about. We're not we're absolutely in no way during the service saying, you know, you person who has been going into an unarranged overdraft for six months uh, continuously, you need to get this line of credit. You know, that's that's, that's not how it works. It's you know, it is it is taken with all care and, and responsibility to make sure that even vulnerable customers, um, you know, are, are aware of, of, of what they're doing and, and how the and how the product works. Um, and we are regulated to offer um, to introduce people uh, to financial services with the uh, un, under the FCA. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of standards that we have to uh, upkeep for, for that as well. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. My name's Steve Dolan, an interested observer, but then aren't we all? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm interested to know how um, data protection legislation, developments like GDPR coming through on the 25th of May, uh, impinge on this area. I'm quite puzzled as to who is the data owner in all of this, where the informed consent is, how uh, uh, Bud plays this. Does it own <coughs> just the conduits or does it own the data itself? I mean, it, there seems to be a big regulatory issue there, yeah, particularly around informed consent, how are the, these uh, early adopters being actually uh, allowed to exercise their, their new rights? Yeah, I mean, Great question. Difficult question as well. Um, but we built Bud to be GDPR compliant from from the start. And um, you know, we when it's, when we when we onboard users, they go through a, a an initial consent. Um, and I can, if I had the customer journeys, you'd see that there are consent pathways for for, for a lot of the experiences that are that are within the um, within the application. All of the data processing and all of the data mining and, and, and machine learning AI algorithms that we use are all it's all done on uh, anonymized data. Um, so there's no kind of you know personal information that that, that links people, which falls outside of of things like GDPR. Um, and any time a customer goes through um, and and you know signs up to a product or or links their um, their bank account, uh, you know there are. Um, kind of screens within that that process, which tells them exactly, you know, what information they're providing to whom, and what is going to be come back, what's going to come back, and how that data is going to be presented to them. So, um, you know, there are things that, I guess, in some senses, open banking and GDPR seem almost at odds uh, against. But we've, uh, you know, we believe we've kind of, you know, created these user journeys that and consent pathways, which, um, you know, which keep users informed about what they're doing, but also uh, means that we're com compliant with, with all the new regulations. In terms of who owns the data, um, the customer. And the GDPR, the customer owns the data, so they have the right to, uh, you know, um, to all the conditions of, of, of GDPR. Um, Can I just build on that? Hang on, I think well, you'll have. Well, actually, my question is related to. Well, it's about trust, you know. Okay. But, yes, just please, have a second thought, and then we can move on. Just to say that it sounds as though you've done a lot of the right things, but this is a trust business, yep. and we're living in, a, in an environment now where not everybody who knows about IT can be trusted. I, yeah, um, in fact, I there are a lot of bad boys out there and girls. Um, it doesn't, it's not going to take very many LinkedIn-type um, uh, misadventures for, for trust to be really heavily undermined. I mean, have you thought about resilience around that sort of issue? Yeah, I think when our when we were kind of looking to our distribution model, um, you know, working with larger banks, um, there's a certain amount of due diligence in terms of technical and security standards that you have to go through um, to to do that. So, I think we we initially set up to um, you know to be very very uh, security conscious and built around security, um, and then kind of you know providing the service and going through due diligence of a, of a large bank. And then using their brand as a as a as a kind of a, a, a way to offer a, a world leading service, I think is 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 how we've tackled a uh, delivering a financial product with a brand that not many people know about. Um, you know, by providing technical services to, to to big banks who want to offer those those services. So I think in terms of in terms of trust, that's how we've gone about it. In terms of um, you know security, we have the exact same kind of opinions of of, of a bank. If you if anyone feels like they've anything suspicious, then they should definitely notify their, notify their bank. Yeah, I, um, two things in what you said. 
Uh, anonymizing data robustly is actually really hard, so I, I was wondering, you know, how you're going to protect that data from re-identification re via matching other databases and so forth. And the second thing is, how do, how, what do people do when they want to revoke permission to share data for a particular thing, or do they authorize each transaction? Yeah, so in terms of the, uh, the, the particular capabilities around our, uh, our, our data uh, model, and, and, and securing that data. I'm not the best person to, to, to ask, unfortunately. Um, I can connect you to, 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 to the person who is, um, if, if, that, if that's gonna be beneficial. And revocation? Revocation, uh, you can delete the account from within the, uh, from within the app, and then that deletes all the data associated with you from, that, we've, that we've held. Well, I meant more revoking. <coughs> I meant more of revoking the sharing, like if you've, if you've decided to share data with a particular supplier and you want to, you want to sever that. You can unadd the product on the, on, on the but app. But they would keep the data you'd already given them. Uh, again, again I, I don't know the, the, the facts on that one, but I can, I can connect to someone who does. Any further questions? Uh, my name is Yusak. So what do you think of the likelihood that uh, uh, open API or open banking facilitates uh, regular tech services or uh, yeah, regulatory uh, reporting services. So how will open banking facilitate reg tech and reporting? Um, God, that is a good question. Um, I don't know. It's not, I, I, reg tech is not my, it's, it's not my, my aspect. I, I assume that it will have, it can have a, uh, you know, quite a profound effect. I suppose if you're thinking anything around AML, um, anything which gives you access to, you know, to, to, to cleaner, uh, safer access to, to, to transactional data, I imagine, will be um, helpful for anyone performing those uh, those, those kinds of uh, activities. So, yeah. We've got time for one more question. Uh, did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Hello, I'm Eduardo, a student Hi. from Imperial College. Uh, thank you for the presentation, first of all. Thanks. Uh, you are currently active in the UK, correct? Uh? Yes. Okay, so uh, in case of international expansion, I'm sure you already thought about it, uh, how would you deal with the different speeds uh, at which uh, the PSD2 is being implemented in different countries? Like, for example, here is already up and running, but especially for the payment initiation system, there are countries which would take the full 18 months of, uh, of time span given to implement. Yep. How would you overcome in case of... Yeah, so I think it's a great question, um, and we, you know, we've had a lot of interest from from outside of the UK for for, for this. Um, I think we are trying to, you know, trying to do the right thing in the UK first, and, and learn all our lessons uh, here before we kind of, uh, you know, look very very hard at, at what's next in, in in Europe. We have been invested in by um, uh, some banks in in Europe. Um, so by a bank in Europe, so there will be kind of opportunities, I, I believe, kind of in, in, in the future. Um, but we'll work with the uh, you know local regulators and, 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 and local banks to make sure that we have a, a product in market which is you know something that customers actually want to use. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it draws the uh, the lecture to a close. Thanks everyone for coming, and can we give Jamie a final round of applause? Thank you.